All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to give the R word today. Repentance. We're going to talk about repentance. Amen. Let's look at verse 8. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorry, sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now watch this. This is so important. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Amen. Right. But, that means the opposite is about to occur here. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Boy, I think I would have to know the terms and definitions here. I think I better get a hold of what God's telling me that repentance is. Because if I don't got it, I want it. Right. Amen? I don't want to sin, die, and burn in hell for all eternity. Amen. What I want to do is I want God to reach and touch in my heart and show me where I fail. I want Him to show me where I'm weak. Show me my sin and put a light on my sin-darkened heart. Turn the heavenly lights on, so to speak, way down deep in my heart where I haven't even realized that I'm a gutter dweller. Every one of us, amen, if you're born of woman, you're born a sinner and your pride and your arrogancy and your hatred and your prejudice, all is standing against you and you don't even know it. Yeah. It takes godly sorrow. It takes God through the preaching of the Word of God to smite your heart and to show you what's wrong with you. Oh God, show us this morning what's wrong with us so that we can allow God to have it and to fix it, and to change our lives. Amen. Amen. Paul had written a letter here of concern in 1 Corinthians. They had gotten loose in their doctrine. And by the way, when you get loose in doctrine, your your actions and your manner is shortly after. Right. They had a man in an adulterous affair with his own stepmother. Yep. Boy, there's a lot of complications to that. Anyways, they had greatly insulted God, this church did, because they were allowing it to go on. They had marred Christ's name in the community. Because after all, why would you go to a church where a man can be in an affair with his own stepmother? And then they had grieved the Holy Ghost of God. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, it says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Yep. He's saying you're, you need to get them out of your body. Yeah. Like a disease. You need to cut them away and uh, uh, excuse them from your table. Excuse them from your fellowship because you are marring your testimony, because you are offending the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are quenching and grieving the Holy Ghost of God. But here in 2 Corinthians, we find that they did just that. They got rid of that fella and his stepmom, especially him. I don't know if she was a member of the church or not, but he was. And so now this second letter, Paul is congratulating them for their stand. See, what had happened is when they read the Word of God, you know what effect it had on them? It made them sorry for what they had done. Amen. See, that's the whole purpose of preaching the Word of God is for you to hear it and it to make you sorry Amen. for your sin. That's the whole reason we're here today. Even as Christians, people that have been washed in the blood we need a foot cleansing from the labor of God. We need the Word of God to make us so so that we can turn to Christ and be cleaner than when we walked in the door. Right. 
Amen. If you get preaching that makes you glad and doesn't make you sad in your sin, you haven't heard preaching, my friend. Right. You've heard ear tickling. Right. Amen. But preaching will make you sorry. Anyways, now these people, because they had become sorry, they had a godly sorrow, and they repented and they got on the straight track again, now they're cleared before the throne of heaven. Their prayers are potent. Their praise is practiced. And the preaching is powerful again. Amen. Amen. Because they repented. Right. You want God to show up in your life? Don't look at emotions. Don't look at anything that's appealing to the eyes. Look to your sin and compare your sin to a godly Savior. Amen. And if you are found wanting, you turn to Him and God promises to show up in your life. Now, they did not fall into the snare of worldly sorrow. See, he mentioned godly sorrow, which leads us to repentance, and then he mentioned worldly sorrow, which leads to death. They didn't fall into that snare. They fell into godly sorrow and got right with God. Amen? Right. If you want to be right with God, man, get sorry. Get sorry for what you've done to offend Him. Get sorry for just how sorry you are. Amen? Right. Amen. <laughs> the Lord is near a, <coughs> a broken heart. <coughs> a contrite heart He will not despise. The Bible says. Anyway, a worldly sorrow is like O Esau that we find in Hebrews 12 and verse 16. The Bible says, He's a profane man. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it goes on in verse 17. He says, For you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Yep. You see, Esau did not repent in his heart toward God because of his sin. He faked it to show his daddy that he really was sorry so his daddy would give him a blessing. Yep. You know how many people in churches do that? They shake a preacher's hand. They go, oh, I'm, you know, I just need God in my life. And what they're doing is they've got caught. I'm going to tell you what, a little something about worldly sorrow. And that's really what I'm preaching on this morning. Is worldly sorrow. First of all, it brings death. Yep. Yep. It said it right there, didn't it? Worldly sorrow brings death. You just want to get sorry and change your life around. I'm sorry what I did to my wife. I'm sorry that I kicked the dog. I'm sorry that I was a dud at work. And I'm going to try to make my life right. We read this morning, Jesus preached in Matthew 12. You try to sweep that devil out of your house, he's going to come back seven times hotter. Yep. Seven times meaner. Seven times harder. You can't clean yourself up. That's right. Can't do it. See, that's worldly sorrow. And it leads to death. You're still going to die and go to hell. But godly sorrow doesn't bring death. It brings life. That's right. Amen? When you have worldly sorrow, there is no comfort. Oh, you can be comforted for a few minutes. Like, you know, one of you fellas get busted with pornography with your wife. You can get you can get right with her for a few minutes with worldly sorrow. Oh, I'm so sorry. I love you. I won't do it again. Blah, blah, blah. But then if you don't have true repentance, but you have worldly sorrow, you won't have the ability to overcome it. Right. You're still going to be stuck in the slime pit of it. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Right. There's no comfort for you. As a matter of fact, when you have one sorrow, it still keeps you in your guilt and shame. But if you have godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, it clears you of all debt, clears you of all guilt and shame. The ultimate goal of worldly sorrow is death. Or perhaps suicide. Can't take it anymore. 
I can't do it. I, I can't hold this line. I, I can't continue this way. I can't live up to the standard. The ultimate goal is for you to kill yourself. Yeah. That you get so sorrowful. But replent, repentance... When you have a godly sorrow, yes. when you'll hear the preaching of the Word of God and apply it to your sins as, as compared to a holy Christ. My friends, it takes the sorrow that you have and it places it where it belongs. It doesn't belong on you. Christ died for you to bear your sorrow. That's right, yep. It's all on Calvary. It's all on the cross. So we go messing around with sorrow and we produce a worldly sorrow instead of a godly sorrow. We're going to fall right in the pit. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with His stripes we are healed. Right. So what's the difference really between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world? I mean, really, I, I think if we're talking about it, I think we better understand the terms. And we better know that when we walk out of here, if we've ever experienced sorrow when it comes to God, we better know if it was a worldly sorrow or if it was a godly sorrow. Amen. We better know that. Heaven and hell is in the balance, ladies and gentlemen. Right. A life of power and grace and mercy and blessing versus a life that is not a life that just leads to destruction. That's what's in the balance here, you see. So, what's the difference? Well, sorrow of the world is basically this. And some of y'all may get mad at me, and I know this is not uh, politically correct. In psychology, they sure are going to hate what I'm going to say here. But I care about as much as I care about a flea. Sorrow of the world is nothing more than self-pity. That's what it is. It's self-pity. I got caught. Yep. Now I have to find a way because I love myself. Because I pity myself. I've got to find a way to relieve this suffering. To relieve this spotlight uh, shining on me. People will do that. They'll come to church. Maybe their mama will bring them or something. That young boy, everybody knows he's been a terror in society. And he's been caught. He's been busted. He can't handle it. So what he does out of self-pity is he'll call on Jesus to pull him out of his trouble. Many a child or husband even wives, they get saved to get out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just get saved because I know that my wife is saved and she'll be glad. That's worldly sorrow. It's self-pity. It's really basically a means of manipulation. I'm going to tell you something. You can manipulate mom. You can manipulate dad. You can manipulate your spouse. You can manipulate the preacher, but you can't manipulate Jesus Christ. No, nope. right. It goes right along with self-love. See, godly, uh, worldly sorrow is nothing but self-pity. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. There in verse 9, he says, Ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, it's a work in the heart from God. Let me just tell you something. If here this morning you're thinking, please, please, Brother Sam, shut up. You're killing me. You're busting my heart wide open. You're making me mad. You're naming things I don't like. You're making me uncomfortable. Can I tell you a little secret? That's not Brother Sam. That's not me. All I'm doing is telling you what the Word of God has to say. That's the Word of God busting your chops and busting your heart. That's the Word of God trying to reprove you through the spirit of worthless and sin and corruption and idolatry and fornication and adultery and drunkenness and a murder 
start. You say, well, I've never done any of those things, Brother Sam. Yes, you have. Yeah. If you've ever put anything before God, you're an idolater. And you're going to burn in the same hot hell that a heathen that worshiped totem poles is going to burn in. Yeah. I'm not saying this to be angry. I'm not saying this to be mean. The only one I'm mad at this morning is the devil. Amen? And I'm going to tell you why I'm mad. Because while I'm preaching this, some of you will be listening to this, whether it's online, whether it's through the recording, or whether it's present. You'll be listening to this and be getting angry and want to shut it off and thinking, that guy's a jerk. I don't want to listen to that guy. I'm going to tell you something. you got a friend in me. I'm, you better listen. Amen. You better Listen to the Word of God so you don't go to the church pew today. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Godly sorrow will change your life. It's not self-pity. It's self-condemnation yeah. because of my sin. Amen. And it turns you from looking to yourself to looking to the Savior. Compare yourself to Him. Yeah. So it's self-pity. Here's something else about worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is not only self-pity, it is a shallow profession. A person out of self-pity will come forward and they'll trust Christ or give their life to Jesus. They'll make some kind of a commitment or a dedication to be a better Christian. You can't. Right. No man can live the Christian life in his flesh. Do you know that's the whole reason there's all these denominations and stuff? Yep. Because people are trying to be Christians in the flesh. We're going to baptize the way we want. We can make the Lord's Supper mean what we want it to mean. We can evangelize the way we want. We can print any Bible we want. We can do anything we want because, hey, I'm a Christian. That makes me better than you, but I'm going to do it on my terms. In God's book, that makes you stink. Yes, right. You're a hypocrite. Amen? Amen. Yep. It's a shallow profession. Make some kind of commitment. And the problem is, is they're still in the shame of sin. They're still in the guilt of sin. They're still in their shame. They're still hiding things. But see, repentance is different. Godly sorrow, repentance is different. It leads to salvation, ladies and gentlemen. See, let me tell you something. All of these religions in the world, including, I'm going to say Christendom, instead of Christianity, because most people wouldn't know Christianity if it hit them right between the eyes. They... Like we said last night, we're in the Bible belt and the number one thing it needs is a good belt of the Bible. Yep. Amen. It has no idea what the Bible has to say about anything or what a Christian is. Yep. Yep. Amen. Uh, <coughs> most of Christianity and all other religions, it's all about teachings, philosophies, and lifestyles. Am I right? Yep. But let me tell you something. When you meet Christ, it has nothing to do with what church you went to. It has nothing to do with your baptism or your upbringing or your culture or your social status or your education. It's about, do you know Him? Amen. Not about Him. Not what the Bible says about Him. Not just following His teachings. Do you know Him? Amen. Right. Christianity is a person. It's not, it's not just a teaching. It's not just a philosophy. It's knowing Christ. Right. See, that's what brings the repentance is because you're hearing the Word of God preached. Whereas if any of you are like me, I hated the preacher that I was stuck listening to in Hahn, Germany in 1991. I wanted to smack that bald-headed man right off the stage. I couldn't stand it. I thought maybe he was calling my wife and saying, what do you want me to preach today? What did Sam do this week that you can that I can straighten out? That's what I thought was going on because I thought, I'm looking at her and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, is there something going on here? Because I'm sick of this old boy jumping with both feet in my chest every Sunday. I was sick of it. Yeah. But oh, one day I went from mad to glad. Amen. I got glad because I realized something. I realized, you know what? That old boy don't have anything against me. Uh -huh. He loves me enough to preach the gospel, though it'll make me mad. Amen. 
And here I am wanting to knock his block off, but at the same time, he's trying to tell me the truth because I, I'm not only a person that makes mistakes, I'm a person that's right. And I'm on purpose because I'm right. yeah. That's who I am. Yeah. And the light started coming on and I started seeing in my own heart. And I realized that he loved me and that Jesus loved me. And I turned to Christ. I met that day. All of that hatred I felt in my heart was nothing more than the sovereign, beautiful, holy, clean, right. He can take sin out. And he did. He did. He did it. Right. He did it. I didn't follow a teaching. You know, I'm thinking I'm gonna be a better Christian. No, 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 no. That's worldly sorrow. Yes. At least to death. But no, my friends, what he did is he came in. He interfered with my life. Yeah. He stepped in there. Wait a minute, I thought we were going to church today. I ain't into all this preaching my head off stuff. What's that about? You know what that was? That was Jesus stepping in going. Well, here I am, Sam. What are you going to do with me? Yes, right. I thank God that I turned to Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's a shallow profession. Number three, worldly sorrow is a sinful progression. So what do you mean by that? Well, worldly sorrow rejects the person of Christ. Yes. And ultimately still looks to self. Remember, it's self-pity. Jesus at this point becomes a good luck charm. A sidekick. A buddy. A co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Since I got saved, He's been my pilot. It's His. It ain't mine. My hands aren't on the wheel. It's Him. See, the thing is, when you have worldly sorrow and you say, I'm going to clean my life up so I can get along with my wife, I can get along at the church, I can get along with my parents and all this stuff, you'll still constantly find yourself over and over and over being sorry, but with no relief. Because you'll keep falling back into the same sin. Right. The only remedy for sin is Christ. His blood. His person. Only He can save you. That's why it's so important He's resurrected and He is at the right hand of the Father. Not just His blood on the throne or or on the mercy seat. He is there. He is there. Amen. It's about Him meeting Him. Amen. And where we stand in Him. And if we don't meet Him and we want to just be more like Him and what we hear about Him, you're still going to end up Going through this worldly sorrow over and over and over and over. Why do I keep failing? Why do I have to keep rededicating my life? Constantly asking God to forgive you. Can I tell you something about God's forgiveness? And if you take anything away from this message, take this. God can only forgive you through the cross. Yes. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness between human beings, that transaction cannot take place unless there is a price paid. Yes. A restitution. That's right. Mm-hmm. Amen. This world's philosophy, well, I forgive them. Again, another teaching is so far from the Bible. Because if God was like that, well, He'd forgive us all and not throw any of us in hell. Yep, that's right. Mm-hmm. But he's not like that. You say, well, I've asked for forgiveness, so I'm good. You know how many people we run into street preaching, I'm good, I'm good. I've asked for forgiveness, I'm good. And their preacher who's lost as a ball in high weeds is teaching them that. You're not good. Nope. you got to come to Calvary to have forgiveness. Yep. There has to be a transaction made between you and Christ. Yes. Between you and God the Father and Christ the sacrifice. And it is a sorrow 
When you, when the Holy Spirit of God strikes your heart from the Word of God and shows you what you are and you look at what Christ had to do to fulfill uh, uh, the wrath that God has against you, it's a godly sorrow. Yep. And you meet Him and He changes you forever. Because from that point on through the rest of your life, you don't see, well, let me see what the Bible says. Well, what does the preacher think? No, 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 my friend. You see Him. And it makes you change things up. You'll start getting farther and farther away from God. And you'll wonder what in the world happened. Yep, that's right. But repentance is different. It brings in an instant cleansing. And the progression is not sinful. The progression is sanctification. Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You know the reason that these people that have come forward and said, I've gotten saved and they've gotten baptized and so on, the reason they leave their church, the reason they leave their parents, the reason they leave their spouse and so on, is because they're going in the opposite direction of them. The problem is they've made had a worldly sorrow and they've made a self-pitying profession. Self-pity makes you will make you see your shortcomings, will make you see other people's shortcomings very clearly. If I came into this church and I wasn't saved, but I, with worldly sorrow, I made a confession, it wouldn't take long before I'd say, you know, uh, man, you Chicago people, y'all need to tighten up on this. and You uh, former Tullahoma people, y'all need to straighten this out in your life. And you folks from Michigan, well, enough said. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? What's going to happen is I'm going to start looking around. Because I'm a self-pitying, worldly sorrow jerk. Yeah. Instead of being saved. Right. But when godly repentance hits, it'll make you see your sins very yes. clearly. Exactly. Not theirs. Yours. We wonder why there's so much gossip in churches. Mm -hmm. But I guess the greatest problem with worldly sorrow is that it leads to certain perdition. Genesis 6-3, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The Bible does not declare that Esau ever got saved. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 12-16, he is called profane, which means common, or trampled. That means that old boy had a chance to repent and he didn't. And I don't know how many chances he had after that. The Bible doesn't record it. But at some point he was reprobated. You say, what does that mean? Romans 1 28 says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, you hear a message like this. By the way, you know it's true. Everybody that's hearing this message knows it's true. Yes. You know it's true. I'm quoting scriptures. You know it's right. I'm naming it. God's naming it. God's trying to straighten somebody out. And then I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want to hear about me anymore. God says as much as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them all to a reprobate mind. Yeah. Which means you send away your day of grace. It means God will never draw you again. You can be walking for the next 50 years and you can come up with all the sorrow you want. And if you're reprobated, you're a dead man walking. Yep. Pharaoh, I still can't get over how he pursued the Israelites to his own end. What kind of... He's the world leader. And he follows them into the Red Sea where he is channeled. No leader does that because arrows will kill your whole army. He's channeled between walls of water that are held up by a fiery beam that's keeping him from the Israelites. You say, how can a man be so dumb? How can he do so unintelligent? I'll tell you how. It was not a matter of academics. 
It was a matter. It was a spiritual matter. He was full of sin and he wasn't going to have God tell him what to do. And it made him a spiritual dumb dumb, And he died in that state. Yeah. Pharaoh went to hell that day. But I want to tell you something. I believe when they took his firstborn, he was already consigned to hell at that moment. Because his heart was so hard. I don't want God telling me what to do. I don't want somebody telling me. Once you're on the road of worldly sorrow, you might never get off of it. Repent for it's too late. Quit feeling sorry for yourself and become sorry for your sins against God. You know, that was the difference when I got saved, Brother PJ. Amen. You know what changed? Is I quit going, now God, if you'll get me out of this mess, yep. I'll start serving you. I'll go back to church. I'll be, I'll do this. I'll read my Bible. Right. I'll do, I'll do whatever you want, God, if you'll pull me out of this. That all stopped. You see, that was self-pity. That was worldly sorrow. I was feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. But the day I finally repented, only thing that crossed my mind was this. Oh, how he suffered because of me. Yep. That's right. I want to close. Look at verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. He says, godly sorrow. Now look as we continue. He says, for behold this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. He said, what carefulness it wrought in you. Do you know something? When, when I got saved, when I repented, and it was a godly sorrow, and I listened to God, all of a sudden, I became very diligent to conquer things in my life. I saw how God can knock down the barrier of sin. Well, He can knock down any little, uh, habit I have. He can knock down any little pet sin I have. I became very diligent. I became very careful all of a sudden. See, before I just lived how I want, just don't get caught. But when I got saved, I became careful not to go back into that sin again. I didn't do it. God did it. He says, look at this. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Clearing. I was clean. He says, yea, what indignation. In other words, I had indignation against my old life. I thought, how could I ever been that bad off? Here I am saved today. How could I have ever been that bad? Why didn't I get saved when I was 20? Amen. He says, yea, what fear. You know what? I'm afraid of sinning now. He says, yea, what vehement desire. Now I hunger and thirst after righteousness. He says, yea, what zeal. I wonder why, you know, I, I used to wonder why so many Christians were such fanatics. Yeah. I used to wonder, you're, you're a fanatic. Why can't you just believe in Jesus and move on? Quit picking on stuff. Just believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Let's all get along. I thought they were nuts. You're a fanatic. Someone to stand out and preach, street preach, I thought, you're a fruit loop. You've lost it. You're nuts, right? But guess what? Now I guess I'm a fanatic. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. Oh, I'm sorry. He says, yea, what revenge? Now listen to me very clearly. And I'm going to close with this thought. Godly sorrow is the opposite of worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow will leave you in your sin. It will lead you in a progression away from God. It will keep you in your self-pity. But godly sorrow, God is trying to come in and show you the real you. Okay? When you turn to Christ, you see yourself as God sees you, and you see yourself as needing only what God can give to help you because you can't help yourself, when you get to that point, you will have revenged. See, right now you are held captive by the cords of sin and you can't break free. By the way, I want you to listen to the baying of the hounds of hell because you have an appointment with death. Yes. 
But you're held captive. But I want to tell you that when you turn to Christ, He tramples that under His feet. You will turn around and the sins that held you don't hold you any longer. That's right. Amen. You get revenge on them. Oh, yeah. Glory. Amen. I pray that, I pray that Holy Ghost reproof today through the preaching, the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel of Christ has caused Godly sorrow so that men will repent, turn to Christ. Yes, we'll have a heavenly home, but that's not what it's about. It's about being made free from that sin Amen. that holds you down. Amen. We'll stop right there. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed.